Welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, this time we're going to be going over another key metric when analyzing the financial statements, return on assets, also known as ROA. So once again, with a lot of these topics, you can find plenty of junk content and AI generated articles about the concepts, but I wanna focus more on the real life applications of something like this and what it can tell you about actual companies. So is ROA useful in financial models and valuations? Is it only useful or interesting in certain very specific cases? If you want the full written version of this tutorial, the screenshots and the Excel examples, you can go to this URL, bringintowallstreet.com slash KB slash financial statement analysis slash return on assets ROA dashes in between all those. I'll link to this in the comments and pin it as the first comment so you can get it right there and click the link and get all the files. So here's the short answer. Return on assets is defined as a company's net income in a certain period divided by the company's average total assets over that same period. So if it's a year, you would take the net income for the year and then you would take the average total assets. So you take the assets at the end of the year and the assets at the beginning of the year and average them and use that in the denominator. Now, net income is just the company's bottom line. So it's profit after taxes on the income statement. Total assets represent the company's resources on its balance sheet. There's no strict definition of an asset, but generally it represents something that could deliver potential future benefits to the company, such as cash inflows or cash flows or potentially a higher valuation or something like that in the future. ROA tells you how efficiently a company is using its total assets to generate after-tax profits. So if two companies are similar, but one company has a higher ROA than the other, then the company with the higher ROA should, in theory, trade at higher multiples. And I say in theory here because in reality, Return on assets is a metric that's mostly useful for financial institutions such as commercial banks and insurance firms because these companies make money directly with the assets on their balance sheet. Most companies in other sectors do not do this. Maybe there's an indirect relationship or maybe there's a partial relationship, but it's not nearly as direct as it is for financial institutions. So if you're looking at a tech startup or a biotech startup or a services company or something like that, these companies are going to be valued based on their employees and productivity and innovation and future revenue potential. And none of that shows up directly on a company's balance sheet for the most part. Employees certainly do not show up ever on the balance sheet. So return on assets is just not a useful metric for companies in these industries. That's the short answer. Now let's go through the longer answer here. Here's the outline with timestamps. So we're going to go through ROA calculations for Target and Costco first. Then we will go through ROA for banks and look at a quick comparison between JP Morgan, Citi, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America for the biggest banks in the US. And then we'll discuss a little bit about how you might use ROA in real life in financial models. So let's go to the ROA calculations first. Now the calculations here I think are pretty simple because you can pull all the numbers directly from the statements. Now you may have to adjust net income for non-recurring expenses, but it's not really necessary for a quick analysis. So let's just go into the file that I have here for Target and Costco and make these calculations. I've already pulled their total assets and net income from their historical financial statements and filings. I also have a capital IQ subscription. So I've gotten a lot of the company's numbers from here just to save a bit of time. So we're going to take Target's net income for fiscal 2021, and then we'll divide by the average total assets over this period. So the ending fiscal 2020 number, and then the ending fiscal 2021 number, and we can copy this across. And then for Costco, we are doing pretty much the same thing. Now their fiscal 2024 has not ended yet because their fiscal years end on August 30th or August 31st, but let's just calculate the return on assets for the years that we actually have. And we'll copy this over. And once we have this, what we'd like to do is look at this in relation to the company's valuation. So we have their equity value and enterprise value. Let's take the enterprise value to revenue multiple, and then the enterprise value to EBITDA multiple, and then the PE multiple. So the equity value divided by the net income here. And we can pretty much copy and paste these down to save a bit of time for Costco. Let's just check the links here. And it seems like all these are good. What is the interpretation here? Overall, if you look at ROA for both these companies, they're in pretty similar ranges of about eight to 10% for Costco, we could say. And then if you look at Target, the range is definitely more varied, but we would say it's probably five to 13%. If we take a quick average here, just to see what it comes out to, or maybe a median, it's about 8.6%. So 
Overall, these companies both have ROA figures in the high single digit percentages, we could say that. But the interesting thing is that Target's multiples are far lower. They're trading at around 1x revenue, 11x EBITDA, 20x PE. Costco is trading at 1.3x revenue, 29 times EBITDA, and 47 times for the price to earnings multiple. Our gut reaction is that Costco seems to trade at unbelievably higher multiples than Target, even though they're very similar companies with pretty similar ROA figures. Now, if we look at other companies like Kroger and Walmart, for example, let's just pull up the Excel file again. These companies also have ROAs in a pretty similar range. They're a little bit lower, but six, seven, eight percent, something like that. And if you look at the revenue growth and margins, yes, Costco has slightly higher growth and its EBITDA margin is a little bit lower than the others, but these are still very similar numbers overall. Despite that though, Costco trades at much higher multiples than anything else here. If you look at EBITDA or PE or whatever you want, it's trading at significantly higher multiples. And there may be a reason for that, but upon initial inspection, upon first glance, it doesn't really make much sense because again, the revenue growth, the margins, the ROA, these are all pretty similar for the different companies in this set. Now we could go on and look at other data points and maybe there's an explanation for this, but this is what our quick analysis of the ROA versus the valuation multiples here tells us. Let's now move to return on assets for banks. Banks and insurance firms generate their revenue, profits, and cash flows based directly on their balance sheets. Because for banks, for example, loans and deposits are the key drivers. Loans are on the asset side. Deposits are on the liabilities and equity side. And loans are often over 50% of total assets for most banks. So the return on assets metric is critical here because a bank that is using its assets more efficiently means that the bank is earning more from its loans. It is generating higher net income that higher net income is going to flow into the bank's shareholders' equity, and that in turn will support future growth because a bank can only issue loans in relation to its shareholders' equity. So there is very much a direct relationship here between all of this, and a bank that is doing this more efficiently will be able to grow more quickly and should be worth even more in the future. If you want more on that, you can take a look at our bank regulatory capital tutorial from last year, which we used to explain the Silicon Valley bank collapse back in March of 2023. Let's go through a quick calculation here for JP Morgan and Citigroup, and then we'll do a higher level comparison between Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, and Citigroup. So let's go in. I've taken all of these from Capital IQ once again, just to save time, but you could potentially get these from the company's filings if you want. So net income divided by the average total assets here, copy this over, and then we can pretty much just copy and paste this down for Citi as well. So the first impression here is that JP Morgan has a much higher return on assets. They're between 1% and 1.5%. Citi, we would say, is more like 0.5% to 1%. That may sound like a small difference, but in percentage terms, it means that JP Morgan is quite a bit higher. Now, as expected, JP Morgan does trade at a price to book value multiple of around 1.9x versus only 0.6x for Citi. The weird part, though, is that the PE multiples are pretty close, around 11 or 12 for JP Morgan and more like 13 for Citi. So we don't know exactly what explains that. That is one oddity here. It could be something like a non-recurring expense. It could be a large gain or loss or something like that, but we'd have to dig into that in a bit more detail to see. As with normal companies, you can certainly look at ROA here, but you also wanna look at some other metrics like the loan growth, the return on equity, the net interest margin. You wanna look at the regulatory capital levels for common equity tier one, tier one capital, and so on. If we make a wider comparison here, and we look at a couple other large banks in the US, so I've picked Wells Fargo and Bank of America here, and I've drawn some scatter plots as well. Here's what it looks like. There is definitely a relationship between the return on assets and the price to book value multiple for these large banks. You can see a pretty clear trend line right here. But if you look at other metrics like loan growth versus the price to book value multiple, there is also a trend line. Now the line is not as steep as it is in the first example, but it's definitely there. So many of these metrics correlate and line up, and you're almost always going to look at multiple different metrics for banks. So while ROA is quite important, it's not necessarily the most highly correlated with price to book value. In fact, if we looked at return on equity or ROE, we'd probably see actually a stronger relationship there. Let's go to the last point I took about ROA and real life financial models. 
So return on assets is rarely, if ever, a direct driver. Even if you're modeling a bank or insurance firm, you're usually not going to drive the model based on return on assets. Instead, it's more of a metric that you calculate after the fact to cross check your work and sanity check your work a little bit and make sure you haven't done anything that is out of line or unreasonable. So for example, if you're assuming that one bank or company is more efficient than the other one, does that actually translate into higher multiples in your model? If one bank has a higher ROA than the other, are its PE and price to book value multiples higher? If you are assuming that they're going to get to a certain ROA, then what types of growth rates and margins would be required and what type of valuation multiple would that actually imply? So this is how you typically use it in financial models. Again, even if you're in an industry where ROA is much more significant. So that's pretty much it. Let's do a quick recap and summary. We started with the ROA calculations for targeting Costco, just net income divided by average total assets in the period. Overall, our work here suggested that Costco is quite overvalued at the moment, but not just because of ROA. It's really because most of its financial metrics are in line with its peers, but its valuation multiples are much higher. Then we looked at it for banks, including JP Morgan, Citi, Wells, Fargo, and Bank of America. And here we got more of a traditional expected result where the banks with stronger ROA and stronger growth, namely JP Morgan, were clearly trading at higher multiples than the other banks, which is pretty much what we'd expect. And then we said a few words about ROA in real life financial models. It's not really a driver in most cases, but it is something that you can look at to check your work and make sure your assumptions and inputs and outputs make some amount of sense. So that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this topic and have some good templates and graphs and Excel examples that you can use whether you're calculating return on assets for normal companies or financial institutions.